Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. I know it's been a while. Um, so first, let's explain that. Um, so why have I been off of vi- video, at least on YouTube? Um, so there's a very simple ex- explanation for that. Um, essentially, people were working on the roof where I work most of the time, and you hear drilling noises and stomping noises on the roof um and among other things and there is wasps flying around mud daubers flying around just it was chaos to be recording here so what i decided to do for i think it was two weeks um whenever i wrote that vengeance for you i think i wrote that gosh i think i wrote that in the rv yeah that that sounds about right um so yeah, uh, that's the reason why. Uh, and I'll go back and record those videos. Uh, in fact, this is actually my first time recording an actual video uh, since being out of here, other than uh, obviously uh, Reels uh, and TikTok, uh, which I'll try and upload to the YouTube channel here shortly. But you're not here for that. Um, you're here um, to listen to the podcast uh, or watch it if you're on YouTube. And I think Spotify, I think Spotify is the place where my video podcasts go as well. Um, so what is the Austin B Media Podcast? Well, um, it's a short form podcast discussing movies, games, technology, TV, music, and much more. But basically it's t- talking about whatever I want to talk about that I normally don't have time to talk about. Um, and this is episode 10. Uh, sorry it t- took so long for, for me to get to episode 10. Um, but yeah, I mean, some some people take ten weeks to get to episode ten. I take a few years, so checks out. But before we get into all that, I want to set some time aside to thank all the people who help Austin B Media um, stay running. Um, so first, uh, I want to thank Thomas Stone of Judge for his support. Uh, you can check him out on Twitter. And Instagram at being TSJ, although I think he's changed that. Uh, his actual website um, Instagram handle is this is for real underscore IG. That's the one he likes my Instagram photos under um, for my coverage. But that, but you can also, I'll, I'll make sure that's in the description as well. Uh, and that uh, site I just mentioned is moviesforreal.net. He's got a bunch of great coverage coming out all the time. Uh, he's actually who taught me how to basically cover a festival back when we uh, quote unquote met uh, during AFI Fest. Gosh, what was that, 2020? Yeah, we met during 2020, uh, AFI Fest 2020. And so hopefully one day, uh, Thomas, uh, if you're listening to this, hope to meet you. I mean, I've probably said that multiple times in our DMs. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd love to hang out. So uh, hit me up in the DMs. Uh, if you're listening to this. Uh, somebody else I also, also love t- uh, talking to is Shane, Shane Kanto. Uh, you, you might know him as the Wasteland Reviewer. That's his YouTube channel. He also writes for Sif Pop, among, I believe, a whole bunch of other websites. I need to get, like, a list uh, of his websites because he he writes way more than I do. He is He is the person who makes me the most jealous about how much he puts out. Um, he puts out... I think he writes for five different outlets now. It's it's insane. But anyhow, um, Shane, thank you so much for your patronage. It's it's really helps. Uh, every li- little bit helps. Um, and then Joseph Davis, you can also find his work on Seth Pop. He, he's I believe the managing editor over there. Um, helped me get my start and actually helped kind of. Uh, Springboard the idea of Austin B Media while I was writing for him is uh, I was thinking about that gestating the idea of Austin B Media while I was uh, doing Sif Pop and he graciously allowed me to leave Sif Pop to uh, do Austin B Media so so yeah that thank you uh, Joseph and Shane um, somebody else I also like talking to is David Walters uh, DM him a lot uh, and then. Um, and Beulah Beulah, uh, Matthew Th- uh, Simpson, not Matthew Thompson, 
of Awesome Friday. I always love talking to him on DMs. Um, we, I think we should just, this is me just brainstorming in the moment, ADHD brain. Um, but maybe, uh, let me know if you would like a podcast where Thomas, Shane, Joseph, David, and Matt, sorry if you don't like being called, called Matt, Matthew, um, maybe we could get like on a series of like podcasts, that'd be cool, um, but yeah, that, that's something, I always like talking to them, um, Awesome Friday is an invaluable resource, he, he does a lot, a lot of podcasts, or not a lot of podcasts, I think it's just Awesome Friday podcast, but man, he puts out a lot, so go follow him if you can. Uh, I think his uh, handle is at Awesome Friday. I'll have it in the description below for uh, everyone. Uh, and then returning patron uh, Destiny, th thank you so much for rejoining uh, for the High School Musical, the Musical, the Series, Season 3 content. I hope you uh, like my review this week of Episode 6, a.k.a. Uh, Color War. Uh, I think you'll like it. Um, and then Aaliyah, Libby Stevenson's, and Rose, thank you so much. And Rose, by the way, she's a new patron, so th thank you so much, um, doubly, because I don't know how you found me. I'm guessing High School Musical, the musical, the series, season three coverage, but thank you so much. And hey, if you're watching or listening to this and you're not a patron um, or just want to support me in some way, uh, if you can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash austinbmedia or austinb.media slash support for more information. You can donate uh, directly to me there. Um, that, that's just, I, I, where do they do that through? I think it's through Stripe is what they use. And you can set any amount of money. Uh, I had a patron say, hey, um, I, I didn't, I just gave you all the money I wanted to. Um, so if you're ever feeling like, hey, I don't want to join Patreon, but I want to help out. Uh, donating is one way to do it. Um, and then another way, a more complicated way, but I, I, I feel like this might help, uh, is the buy me a coffee system. And that is basically, well, think of the price of a coffee. It's five bucks. You can buy multiple uh, multiples of that, like a dollar, three, oh, not a dollar one cup of coffee, three cups of coffee, five cups of coffee, and then like a custom amount from then, that on that point on. And that's just a one-time donation, just like the other donation, where it's $5 per cup of coffee. Um, and all those links will be right in the description. Um, but we've got a supersized episode, so let's just get right on into it. We got a lot of movies to talk about, because this is, gosh, what, one... This has to... Be, I don't know how long it's been since I've podcasted, so apologies if I run a little long today. Um, so let's talk about Emily the Criminal. Uh, it's Aubrey Plaza. Uh, she's starring in a crime thriller. Uh, it's out. Um, it's not. Out, it's not out on VOD yet, but I think it'll hit VOD pretty soon. Um, but that came out at the beginning of the month uh, of August, and it, it, it's an okay movie. Emily the Criminal is a movie that I think, I don't know, it just, it's like Vengeance, which I talked about in episode nine, I believe, um, where I really, really liked it, and then something happens, and then it just goes off the rails from there. Um, there's just, a, I have a review, and I think I have that linked, and yeah, I have that linked in my recently posted uh, basically something happens in Act 3 or Act 2, one of the acts I can't remember which um, that just makes no sense for what the story is trying to do uh, the story it's trying to tell about like the class divide um, between those with and without a criminal record and things like that it, and there's well I, I don't want to spoil too much but there's just like a out of nowhere plot twist that happens, and it's just and I guess all plot twists are out of nowhere. But it it was just like okay, why is she doing the things she's doing right now? Um, what forced her into that situation? And 
we never really get that kind of resolution. And um, I feel like that's common with a lot of indie movies today, I, which is rather unfortunate. Um, and then uh, I rewatched Lightyear. I'll have a review up soon. Um, I think I, I think I'll have the review up. I think Lightyear hits. Um, oh gosh, I think it hits Blu-ray the twenty-fifth of September. So okay, probably by the fourteenth episode, I'll have uh, my Lightyear rewatch up. Um, which, by the way, I'll I'll uh, mention this later, but. It is one of my 2022 Mid-Year Real Award nominees. I, no, wait. I'm sorry. No, it's not. I got ahead of myself. But there are some Mid-Year Real Award nominees in here. Um, but Lightyear, it's no secret that I love Toy Story. I, you know, I told somebody yesterday, I've probably watched the original Toy Story tens of thousands of times because there is a period of, in my life where I was watching Toy Story day in and day out. I mean, I would get home from school, Toy Story. Um, I'd, I'd finish playing a video game, Toy Story. And then it's just like, I. it surprised me that I never wore a VHS tape out. Like, they had to buy, my grandparents, bless their souls, um, they're not dead, but I, um, um, this was when VHS technology was still, like, new. Um, they had to buy a special rewinder just for me. Well, I, I don't know if that's true, but I suspect it's true that they had to buy a rewinder just so I could watch Toy Story uh, 1 or 2. I think Toy Story 2 was out by that time. Um, I just have vivid memories of like, okay, we got to put it in the tape rewinder again. And it's like, oh boy, thank goodness for DVDs because I think if... DVDs had not come along when they did. I think I would have worn out that VHS. So, so my history with Toy Story is pretty, you know, um, vast. You know, it came out, came out a month before I was born. In, ba- in fact, it came out a few days before I was uh, before I was supposed to be born. I think no, a few days after, uh, because I was actually supposed to be born in November. Fun fact. Um, around my mom's birthday. Um, and one sec. Coffee break. Um, and so that kind of perpetuated the thing of, oh, I love Toy Story. Um, I watched Toy Story 2. Um, as soon as I figured out that there was a Toy Story 2 and watched that, but I didn't really like that. Toy Story 2 was okay for me. It's getting better with eight as as I get older um but it's definitely one of my least favorite Toy Story movies um and then like there's Toy Story 3 and I remember being insanely hyped for Toy Story 3 I remember like insanely hyped it was uh, not to use the same word again but insane how 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 hyped I was I mean I I can still tell you the release date of Toy Story 3 it is June 18th, 2010. I, I can visualize the character posters. I went to see Toy Story 1 and 2 in 3D in theaters um, in 2009 because it was rumored, heavily rumored. Uh, of course, there was no official confirmation because, you know, everything's hush-hush at Pixar, but everyone kind of knows what's coming out from Pixar at that time. Um, but there is some... I, I believe I was reading on Slash Film at the time. Toy Story 3 uh, teaser is going to de- debut at the at this Toy Story 1 and 2 3D uh, event. Uh, and I didn't only just go for that. I also went because Toy Story 1 and 2 were being remastered and in 3D, which was convenient at the time. Like, 3D was new. Um, so it was like, ooh, I wonder what like 3D is like. And remains one of the best 3D experiences I've ever seen, other than maybe Tron Legacy and Mad Max Fury Road. Um, um, but yeah, it, it Toy Story 3 was an insane level hype. And, and I just remember, I can still remember the teaser. It was just like Lincoln Logs and building blocks. And it was just like the 
it didn't even show you anything, but you're still like, oh my, I was still like, oh my goodness, this is nuts that I get to watch a third Toy Story movie. I've been dreaming of it for so so long. I'd I'd been looking o- over the internet. Um, oh my goodness, there's gonna be a Toy Story three, and it's gonna be about Buzz getting shipped to Taiwan. Uh, and was I a li- little disappointed when I watched Toy Story, th- the actual t- trailer for Toy Story 3 and saw, oh no, it's actually about Andy and, you know, him going off to college. Yes, but that's neither here nor there. I mean, I feel like it, that was the better move because I feel like you can't really sit a, um, a bunch of 10-year-olds down and explain how Buzz died, you know, I the for anyone who wants to read about that, I'll link it in the show notes. But it it, it was a nuts uh, story. When Dis- Pixar and Disney weren't playing nice, they made this whole animation studio just to spite Pixar, and it was nuts. Um, and then Toy Story 4 came around, um, and I was like, oh, this, I, I, I don't need this. But I appreciate this. You know, Woody's one of my favorite characters. It is my favorite character besides Slinky uh, and uh, Lenny and then, you know, Bo Peep. Uh, and Bo Buzz is, is pretty down there. Uh, actually, I'd probably replace Bo Peep with Buzz. So he's probably like thir- third or fourth place um, in my lineup. Like, there's just, yeah, and well, maybe Potato Head. Anyways, we're not here to rank, but let me know if you would like a ranking uh, of all the Toy Story characters. Um, but that that Toy Story four was fine. Uh, I I like it. I love it actually, um, because I think it made a case for a movie that people didn't need to see, but I think what was necessary. To close off the story of Toy Story and that and kind of just close the book on it, um, given the things that happened in that movie. I won't spoil that for people who haven't watched that movie from 2019, almost four years later. Um, but another one I watched was Buzz Lightyear of Star Command: The Adventure Begins. It was a directed DVD, or at the time VHS, um, I guess directed video, um, animated movie in the style of a 2D cartoon. Um, not unlike DuckTales, actually, um, and served as a pilot for the uh, TV show Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. It was hour long. Pixar had no envir- in- involvement in it. I think it was Walt Disney Animation Studios or something, or. No, I, I think it was like one of their animation studios for like Disney Channel or something like that or whatever it was called at the time. Um, so um, I hold these characters in very high regard uh, if you got nothing from that whole rant or, or soapbox moment. You should get that out of it. Like, I, And then when it comes to the fact where Lightyear got announced. I was like, okay, um, already no, because Buzz Lightyear of Star Command already exists. Why won't you just make a Buzz Lightyear of Star Command 2? Um, that felt so obvious to me uh, because you already have the source material or the material right there. And as we got closer and closer to release and said, oh, no, this isn't about Buzz Lightyear the toy. This is about Buzz Lightyear that, that the toy is based off of. Uh, and it just got more and more confusing as we got closer and closer to the release. Um, and, you know, Chris Evans is voicing uh, uh, Buzz Lightyear this time around. It's got nothing to do with anything other than the name Lightyear. Um, but I, I, I actually liked Lightyear. Um, I really, really dug Lightyear, even more the sec- second time around. I think it, Angus McLean, the director, realized, hey, I'm, yes, I'm making a Lightyear movie that's 
supposed to stand on its own. And, but also, yes, this is a movie that Andy saw. In fact, the, I think the opening crawl or the opening text is like, in 1995, Buzz got a favorite toy um, or something like that. Uh, this is this is that movie or something like that. Um, so it starts off with this reverence of, no, we get it. We get that that you're coming into this with a bias, and it's okay. Um, but um, I like where it went, um, I think would be the overall arcing, uh, because it, there's constant references to Toy Story 1, Toy Story 2, and Toy Story 3, even Toy Story 4. Um, just, there's just like direct lines um, from Toy Story 1 in here, like from the beginning. Um, like, for, like for example, Buzz is out on like a survey mission and he says, you know, he jumps up and down and says, the terrain's a bit unstable. You know, ju and just like how he says it in Toy Story 1. So from there, I instantly knew, okay, this is going to treat it with a bit of reverence, so I'm fine with it. Um, and that continues throughout the whole movie. I won't spoil the thing that made me not have, um, that had me, made me have less, less reverence for the movie. Um, but I will say that I, I, I think if you're doubting um, whether or not this movie is for you, um, you know, um, even if you don't like Toy Story, I think if you, I think the a pretty apt comparison is forget that this is even related to a kids movie, but also like don't at the same time. It's weird because there are very adult themes ha happening in this movie um, that again I can't spoil, um, but. Uh, I would describe it as Toy Story meets Interstellar. I know that's a super lazy way of saying it, but it really is that kind of emotional oomph from Interstellar met with, uh, oh, hey, I, I recognize that line. Oh, hey, I recognize that reference. You know, it's just a... And it, but it's not... In that sense, it's not, oh, hey, I remember that. It's like, hey, we know you remember that. We're not going to hold on it uh, too long. We're just going to show you a quick shot of something that is definitely from Toy Story, and then move on. Um, it's not going to be like a Marvel movie where it's like a whole scene or anything. Um, well, yeah, but anyways. Um, and I watched it, um, I actually rewatched this in IMAX. Uh, and I actually like, I, I think for anyone who has Disney+, Plus, check out the IMAX enhanced um, versions of uh, any movie. I think you can just go to Disney Plus and then search IMAX Enhanced in the search bar. Or I think there might be even a collection or something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, just check it out because it, I think it's really cool how they adapt IMAX for whatever screen you have. Um, because it's just like it has that same like effect where it's like, oh, this is regular aspect ratio, but it's not like instantly just uh, smushing it down. It it's uh, there's a transition period, just like what happens when you're in a movie theater, which I think is really cool, especially for me where I don't I, I don't want to go to the IMAX, but I'd still like to see um, IMAX versions of of movies. Uh, so when Thor: Love and Thunder comes out, um, gosh, next week. Uh, I'll I'll be watching it that way. So, um, all right, and then let's do some speed round. Uh, a banquet. Um, not much to say about this. Uh, it's a great mood piece. Like if you like horror movies that are psychological, um, check it out on AMC Plus. Um, I I thought it was super spooky, um, but it just kind of drags. Uh, this is from IFC. Um, I think it's a directorial debut, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's just about this girl who suddenly won't eat. Um, and obviously, 
there's the things you, there are themes that are obviously present when you talk about not eating um, there, but it doesn't become like the center of the movie, which is kind of interesting. It becomes much more an intimate relationship between mother and daughter, um, which is kind of interesting for a horror movie, or I guess this would be classified as a thriller to do, um, because I, when I think of a banquet, I'm thinking, oh, she's just going to like start, like there's just going to be blood gushing everywhere. It's going to be like a slasher flick. But no, it, it, it really doesn't get there. So if you're looking for like something in between slasher flick and psychological horror, um, check out A Banquet on AMC+, Plus, or I think you can rent it. Uh, I, I just do it on AMC+, Plus because that's the easier way. Uh, something I, else I watched on AMC+, Plus was Spin Me Around, the Alison Brie um, a ro- ro- romantic dramedy, I think, w- would be the best way to classify this. Um, yeah, I think that would be the best way to classify it. She, she's this manager at this Italian uh, place, Italian restaurant, and she's getting she gets invited to this retreat by um, by her boss, and then it, romantic drama happens. Um, it's obviously like formulaic in a sense, um, but it, it it's never boastful about it. You know, it, it it it's never like oh we know what we're doing here. It's just like. No, yeah, we know what we're doing here, but we're trying to be smart about it. You know, it, it, it never really goes into the thing of where most rom dramedies, um, where it, it, it just tries to make fun of everything and the comedy bits of it. I think it's just, it, it feels like an improv session um, for, for the most part. Um, mixed with like just some sleuthing. It, it, it's got a little spy element to it too, which is kind of, it, it's um, really fun. It, it would be how I'd describe it. Um, and then another AMC Plus uh, movie, actually this is a documentary. Well, there are movies too. Um, it is Hold Your Fire. And this is a documentary about the first ever hostage negotiation. Now, this had happened after Attica, and but um, uh, apologies if I'm a little fuzzy on the details of the documentary. I've, I've watched, as you'll uh, soon discover, um, I've watched a lot in the past since the last time we I did the podcast, so I'm, there are some details I'm a little fuzzy on. Um, but hold your fire, these... Um, Black y- young adults um, hold up the this. Uh, I think they're black Muslims, I believe. Um, hold up this um, sports sporting goods shop in New York, and basically the documentary covers all I think three days of the hostage negotiation. Um, and it, it's, it's really interesting because it's formatted almost like a, a, a drama, um, like Breaking, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, there's just a through line. Yes, there are interviews, um, and it relies mostly on um, uh, footage, archival footage and new interviews, um, but it's so detailed, you feel like you're actually like in the movie, uh, so to speak. Um, the only big part that I didn't like about the documentary, this is the only part I didn't like, um, one hour and 33 minutes. So, okay, it's not the, like, longest documentary ever. Um, in fact, there's one longer that I'll be talking about here, uh, in just a few. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it just felt long, I guess. So the editing wasn't as tight as I wanted it to be. Um, So, I mean, it's a great documentary. I think everyone should go see it. I think it's one of the best documentaries of the year. Um, Whether or not you have AMC Plus, you should check it out. Even if you do like a free trial thing. um, I don't know if it's 
I think it, you can rent it. I, I know it's coming out on Blu-ray here in a few weeks. Um, so go check it out. Um, and you you won't you won't regret it um, because I think the way it tells the story is so fascinating, especially to those who maybe aren't ordinarily interested in a documentary. Um, and I think it, and the wonderful thing it too is it tells both sides of the narrative. It, you know, it talks about what the cops thought and it talks about what the, um, what um, the surviving members of, uh, of of the ho- ho- uh, of the uh, events uh, thought it's not just saying here's everything plain and simple for you here's here's the moment in which you have to sit back and think oh goodness what well um did I do did I, did it, it, is it so cut and dry you know it which I appreciated. Um, they and they, um, it, 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 it's talked about a lot. Police culture, and I, I think, truly one of the best documentaries of the year. I wish I had said something about it for our 2022 mid-year uh, mid-year uh, real awards, because I think if I had watched this, I probably would have put it uh, as one of the best documentaries of 2022. Um, it's a shame I didn't get to see it earlier, but you live and you learn. Um, I also rewatched Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, also IMAX with Hans on Disney Plus. Um, it does not matter how many times I've seen this movie, I don't think I'll ever, 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 ever like this movie. Um, I it, because. There are some Marvel movies I don't like because, oh, hey, it just isn't my thing. You know, Eternals wasn't my thing. I, I like it. Um, it. It wasn't bad. Um, I even like Iron Man 2 to an extent. I like Thor to an extent. Um, but this is one of the first Marvel movies the, of the MCU, I mean, that I just downright hate. Um because it's the problems are on a fundamental level where it misunderstands everything a sequel needs to do and i think i'm starting to see the strain of the mcu on these kind of solo adventures so to speak i mean i call them solo adventures but like really you've got america chavez uh benedict wong um scarlet witch uh, Baron Mordo, uh, a whole bunch of people. I don't know who else is on the poster, and I don't want to spoil anyone who else shows up in the film um, in case people haven't seen it, because that's actually a pretty new film. Um, it just came out on Disney+. Plus. Uh, gosh, what, a month ago? No, three months ago? No. I, I, I want to say July. And uh, apologies for hitting the table. Uh Sometimes when I move around, I hit the table and that knocks the micro- microphone to my left. Yeah, my left, your left. Um, but there's there's just something on a fundamental level that's broken about Doctor Strange 2. Um, I would go in, into those, but I plan on going into those in my review. Um, so all I'll say for now is... Um, if you had said to me in 2017 or even 2016, what do you want from a Doctor Strange 2 movie? I'd be like, you know, he talked, the ancient one talked about the multiverse. I'd like to see some of that. And then they kind of just do that here, but then like don't at the same time or and don't display consequences of your actions, which is like the whole point of this movie. Um, so it, it's... A befuddling choice. The script ha- is befuddling. Um, but one that isn't befuddling is Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. It comes out this week in, um, in wide re- theatrical release as well as on Peacock for, uh, I believe, I don't know if it's pe- only Peacock Premium uh, or everyone on Peacock. I, I want to say it's only on Peacock Premium, but 
comes out September 2nd. Uh, it's got Sterling K. Brown and um, Regina King as the two stars. Uh, they play a husband and wife uh, who who are, I, what would you call it? He's the head pastor, and they call her the first lady in the movie. That's what they call her in the movie. Um, although I don't think that's, like, accurate to, like, what uh, the hus- the wife of a hu- husband who's the pastor is called. It's confusing. Anyhow, the movie's not confusing. It's played up in this mockumentary style that I really, really love. Um, and I'll talk about this a bit in my review, but I'll just give you a preview. Um, it... It, it really digs into um, what makes these mega churches tick. What, like, when a scandal happens, how does a mega church react? Well, in 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 a way, only a mega church can. And by the way, I I am not criticizing Christianity at all. I am criticizing some mega churches. Um, because some mega churches will just like, and in the movie critiques it too, um, while also giving uh, grace, which is something I'll mention in my review. But uh, it, it's not one sided. Like hold your, uh, it's not like hold your fire in which um, it, it just tells both sides. It's like, hey, yeah, this guy might have done these things, and yeah. This stuff is terrible, um, but here's all the other things he's dealing with that maybe drove him to this place that still isn't okay, but kind of broke him, um, and it, it it just does a really good job of that, um, and the set design is, oh my goodness, it looks like every church I've set into. Uh, I set foot into, uh, especially there's one where they show all, I, well, I can't talk about that. Um, I'll talk about it in, like, later. Um, like, if you guys want a spoiler cast, let me know. Um, but, yeah, I, I there there's one moment where I was like, I have been to that church. That is, I've been to that church you know like a, a year ago or something like that it's just so so accurate um and i think it does a great blend of drama film and the quote-unquote documentary style um filmmaking um because there's this nice i, I don't want to spoil it but there's this artistic that cue that lets you know hey this is the dividing line um between what kind of movie you're watching i'll just say that and it it, it, i did not think when i requested this screener um that i would love this movie but i love this movie this is fantastic um in fact this was actually one uh as well as uh dr strange well dr strange was nominated for a few uh is nominated for a few uh, real awards during the 2022 mid-year real awards but uh, Hog for Jesus Save Your Soul was disqualified um, somebody voted for it uh, but it comes out in September which is not in, uh, January through July so um, and, and you know I'll I'll try and get better about that this this next time in the 2023 mid-year real awards um, can't believe I'm already saying that, um, but um, I, I think it was nom- the guy nominated it in production design, and I'd I'd have to agree. Um, it's one of, one of the best. Uh, in fact, I'd even put it in like documentary if you really wanted to get into it. Um, but um, but yeah, go check that out on September second on Peacock. Um, if you, it's four ninety nine a month. I think they're running a big deal on it, so go check it out. Uh, and then I did a big HBO Max binge uh, because 
as I'm recording this, uh, my HBO Max will expire by the end of the day. Um, because for those of you who are, who are unaware, uh, check out my Instagram uh, and TikTok, I believe. I, I believe I put it up there, too. Um, I'll make sure to put it up on YouTube here shortly. Um, but uh, I'm not covering any Warner Brothers Discovery um, um, content past my review of The Princess, which I'll be talking about in, in here. Um, in fact, I might, I might not even review it, if I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I'm, I'm toying with it. Um, anyhow, but I, the first move was to cancel HBO Max and say that's it. Unless David Zaslav, who's the CEO of Warner Brothers Discovery, reverses course, uh, I'm not going to have HBO Max, and I'm not going to cover any um, Warner Brothers Discovery content, including uh, one of my highly, most highly anticipated movies of the year, Don't Worry Darling, which is receiving its own drama this year, this month. Actually, no, this week. Um, just seems everything kind of crash down on that production. Um, but I watched The Fallout. It's a movie uh, where Jenna Ortega's character survives a school shooting along with two other people. And it's about, uh, guess what, the fallout of that. Um, it's a superbly crafted film by Megan Park, which I didn't realize was in a lot of my favorite movies. Um, she's in a ton of movies, but this is her first uh, directorial, um, her first movie. Um, and she, man, she, she's really good at finding that line between, like, you should feel bad and, hey, these are just human thoughts and emotions. Um, because I believe I, sometimes with movies that aren't documentaries that are centered around social events, sometimes what I feel is it, the, the, the um, movie will exploit feelings in order to elicit, like, hey, feel bad. Um, but here it's just like, here's somebody who's dealing with something intensely traumatic and you experience it alongside her. And, and I think it was really well done. And that's not, not to say all the other attempts, uh, at, at this kind of story haven't been well done. Uh, I'm sure there are. Um, it's just not in my experience. I don't like exploitative drama movies. Um, I, it just feels that way at some point, at, at some times. And I actually skipped over one, but we'll get back to it um, after we finish our HBO Max binge. Um, but I highly recommend it. At, watch it while uh, they still have it on HBO Max. Uh, I feel like this is something that could easily remove at any point in time. Um, in fact, like I even when I went to go hit play, I'm like, is is it still on HBO Max? Because <clears throat> Um, a bunch of movies like Moonshot, which I actually did want to see, um, because just for like the popcorn, um, um, movie of it all, um, th th that got removed. So I'm like, you know, I, I haven't checked in a while if the fallout is actually on HBO max, but no, it's still there. Um, it was still there this morning too. Um, I don't know how lo much longer it is. And I'll just apply that banner across uh, everything here. Um, I don't know which ones other than, you know, Tony Hawk until the wheels fall off, Navalny and the princess. Those are safe. Those are safe. But the fallout I am less confident of, uh, because it's an indie movie and, um, I, I don't know. I feel like they've been taking a lot of those off. Maybe not indie movies, but you get my point. Um, mush brain. Um, and then I watched Kimmy, uh, also on HBO Max. Zoe Kravitz is like I, someone who listens to audio recordings of a uh, digital voice assistant called Kimmy, kind of like Alexa or Siri, and um, discovers some vast conspiracy. You've heard this tale a million times. I don't even know why. Ugh. I, 
I had some hope with St- Steven Soderbergh's name attached, but honestly, it turns out to be nothing more than just like, hey, computer bad, but also people bad. So it's like it it is 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 very reductionary. It is is my point. Um, and I I like when I like when movies have a little bit more meat on the philosophical bone. Like this just ends up being like, oh yeah, there are bad people who want to hurt people. Like, yeah. Um, how did you not think of that when you signed up for this company? Um, it it just gets very preachy at points, and I I don't recommend this, but um, this is a HBO Max original, so I don't know if this will be safe or not. So, uh, hopefully it's still there. I, I linked the HBO Max page, uh, the description page, not the actual streaming pages for all these HBO Max HBO uh things, just in case they take it off uh, the service. Uh, and then we had Tony Hawk until the wheels fall off. Um, I'm a big Tony Hawk fan, um, even before, well, I, I wouldn't say before Pro Skater, um, I would just say that, like, I grew up watching the, uh, I, I don't know exactly how I found out who Tony Hawk is, um, I think I was just, like, watching ESPN or something, and uh, the X Games were on, and it's like, who is that, why, there's a person on a board, on, on a ramp what, what what is this um and that person i think turned out to be tony hawk or rodney mullen um so and then the game came out i maybe the game came first and then i saw the x games uh stuff from like the early the mid 2000s um yeah it was probably pro skater that came first the ps1 demo disc uh and then i think from then i recognized them. that 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 makes sense um but yeah, so, and I'd already watched a documentary about Tony Hawk. It was uh, Pretending I'm a Superman, uh, I, yeah, Pretending I'm a Superman, the Tony Hawk, the pro skater story, I believe it was called. Um, it, it's, that mo- that documentary was fine, um, but it focused too much, uh, of course, on pro skater. Um, it, it, it was like, here's what the game was, to a, a generation of people, and oh, by the way, here's what Tony has to say about it. Instead, Tony Hawk, until wheels come off, um, takes a different approach. It says, "Okay, let's learn about Tony, and then let's barely even touch the games." Like, if you're expecting a pro skater expose, go watch "Pretending I'm a Superman," the pro skater story, or whatever it's called. Just search "Pretending I'm a Superman." I think it's streaming for free somewhere. Um, but yeah, I, I, go check that out if you're, if you want to hear about the video game, because Tony says a lot about the video game, but this is much more about skating culture, how Tony Hawk got involved in skating, how he grew up, how he dealt with success, with fame, with the highs and lows. It's everything. I mean, everything, um, up until like a certain point, I think. I don't remember what year it stops in, but, like, eventually just, like, stops. Um, But, like, they barely touch the games, and it's better for it um, because I think I had never realized some things about Tony, the Birdman, um, is how much of an impact he made on skating culture. Like, you, you go and think... Oh, who's the most? You, I think you'd go to anyone on the street and ask them. I'm just putting my coffee cup down for the video. People are like, "Why is he leaning?" Um, but um, if you go on to any anyone on the street and say, "Who? What is skateboarding?" and "Who's your favorite skater?" I think they'd probably say nine times out of ten, Tony Hawk. Now, if you know, um. They're of my age or uh, maybe a bit younger. They might say like Bam Margera or, or someone like that. Maybe Rodney Mullen. Um, maybe Steve Calabaro. Uh, who, you know, may, maybe they'll, but like it's in that circle. Um, 
but like Tony Hawk's name comes up because of the games. Um, and I just think it's fascinating that, to have a, such a comprehensive look because it's like it, this is a movie documentary about skateboarding culture, how Tony Hawk shaped it ultimately. Um, and where um, what, just some deep intellectual things about who Tony is as a person, I, I, I think is interesting. I, I probably put it more eloquently in my letterbox review. Go check that out. Um, but I wrote like eight paragraphs on it. Um, and, and I think this is actually nominated for best documentary at our at my uh, 2022 Mid-Year Real Awards. I, I believe it is. Uh, and I, this would be a strong contender. Uh, I'll, I'll say that. Um, because it, it's just so comprehensive. It, it's everything biopics want to be. Um, that pure encapsulation of who is this person and what impact did they have? And why did they have that impact? And also here's some things that that person that didn't even know. So um, go check it out on HBO Max. It, and um, it's an HBO original documentary, so it might be safe. It might be. Um, also, something that might be safe uh, is Navalny. Uh, it's a CNN Films production, so it's. I think it's safe. It might shift over to Discovery Plus because I know they've got a CNN hub over there. Um, so, but this wasn't my jam. It's about Alexei Navalny after the um, leading up to and after the assassination attempt by the Kremlin. He's a known uh, staunch critic of President Vladimir Putin of Russia. And I think the movie does a, the documentary does a pretty good job um, talking about it, but it's a, Daniel Rover uh, is a bit leading. He's the director of this movie. He is very, very leading um, with his questions. There's, uh, and I say this in my review on Letterboxd, um, I say, you know, something along the lines of, he asked Nav Alexei this question, and you could just tell um, Alexei's it's like, no, I don't want to make that kind of movie. And it's not like a very funny ha-ha, he turns it into a very funny ha-ha moment, but um, up in, but like, up until that last, like last bit of the sentence, he's just like, uh, no. And there's instances where um, Alexei will tell him, hey, go away, and they don't. And it's just super frustrating to see. Like, I love fly on the wall documentaries because it's like, okay, we get to observe and then do the research later. Um, and it felt like I was. I, one, I didn't even get like a basis for who who this guy is. I don't know who Alexei Navalny is. I don't. I still don't uh, have a great idea. Um, after watching the documentary, I have some idea, but I don't have a, a good enough grasp to where I could, you know, talk to somebody at length and a, a roundtable about it. You know. And. So, it, it's just unfortunate. I think I gave it three stars out of five. Um, and this is a uh, nominated documentary. I know people like this. I I think I'm just always going to be in, mostly in the, oh, um, <sighs> I, I'm, I'm going to be in the minority for a lot of things. And just, I, I, I feel like this is one of them. Um, and and then um, let's see, we'll get to this later. Um, the Princess. I watched The Princess last night. That's an HBO documentary, not the one with uh, Joey King in it from Hulu. Um, this is about Princess Diana. Um, this is also kind of just this is shock and awe, kind of a documentary, um, and not in a good way. Um, like, it's just like, oh, hey, it, it's very one-sided. Um, and I don't like one-sided documentaries because I think 
when you get one-sided, you tend to stop listening to the other side of the argument. Um, because the whole argument brought up in this documentary um, is essentially press bat because um, this director and many people of Britain believe that uh, Princess Diana was killed by the press, or at least that's what this movie wants you to believe. Um, I, didn't, I didn't live in those times, so I can't vouch for this. Um, but I think there's something wrong with that because um, it never once asks one of these article editors or anyone to be like, hey, you know, why did you do these things? The closest it ever gets is showing newscasts and this one person gets asked, you know, hey, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to her? Uh, and he's like, well, because people will buy the papers. And it's like, well, but you can't just, like, present that and have that be the answer um, because in, this is the rare case where I would have liked to have heard a new interview because all of this is archival. Um, so it's like, okay, maybe that person changed their view like 20 years later or however long it's been. Um, maybe that editor-in-chief was like, you know, thinking back on it, I really didn't think I did um, that too good of a job with maintaining, like, if you want to go with the thesis that the press killed Princess Diana, um, I, I would have liked to see new interviews that would, that would have presented that as the case because opinions change over the time. Every time I rewatch something, my opinion changes just a little bit. Just a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. Um, or sometimes it changes a lot. And, you know, if, if um, HBO or the um, people putting on the documentary, I, I know this is produced by Sky News. I, I know they could have at least, you know, tracked down one of the people and said, hey, what do you think about what went on at your paper, The Sun, or Daily Mail, or, you know, um, about or surrounding Princess Diana? Do you think you were too invasive? It just feels very shock and awe and not for the right reasons. Um, so I, for that, I can't recommend it. Um, I, I really can't. I, I, I don't even know if I'll write a review on it. Um, because it's so it, it's so bad that I I don't want to dunk on it. It's so um, misplaced that I don't want to dunk on it. Um, and I feel like if I wrote a review, I'd just be dunking on it. Um, but uh, one review I will write is uh, for Breaking, uh, and this is the John Boyega um, movie where he. He plays Brian Easley Brown, I believe is his name. Uh, um, and he, uh, it, it's a true story, for one. Um, and he, um, the story is he breaks into a Wells Fargo bank and, we're not breaks in, uh, although the, I, I, don't, I don't get this title, Breaking 892, I don't get it. Uh, it's never, the title is never explained. Um, anyhow, um, it's just him uh, in that bank for a lot of the movie, and uh, you're going to need to prepare for that. I, I'm, I'm sure it's coming to VOD soon. I can't imagine it'll come any later than September 16th, um, because then it'd be, gosh, that, that'd be uh, half a month. So, uh, how long would that be? That'd be three weeks. Okay, that'd be three weeks. So that makes sense. Okay, but yeah, like three or four weeks. Yeah, I can I couldn't see it any later than that. But um, 
it, it stellar performance from him. I saw it. Um, I actually didn't get a screener for this uh, because I had to watch it through film independent because uh, my my contact uh, didn't a- answer my email. So um, anyhow, um, go check it out if you if you can see it in the theater. I feel like it would be a much better experience than me just sitting here talking to you about it. But um, go check it out. Um, it, it, it's one of those, the most compassionate and psychological and sociological uh, thrillers I've seen. I don't, don't go in with the dog day afternoon aspect of it. Just think about, just let it present itself. Let whatever uh, narrative that you come away with um, represent it for you so and then before we move on to games uh oh by the way that is in theaters right now um i i don't know if it's limited release or not um and princesses the princess is streaming on hbo max and hbo um but the last movie before we get into video games is pure country my mom threw us on uh it's a george Strait movie uh not much to be said here um it's a very eight 1980s a star is born kind of thing where a musician you know is fed up with his production and is just decides to live the easy life and oof it is bad um don't go check it out uh, i mean maybe check it out if it's like streaming somewhere but just don't waste money on it. I mean, it's just George's acting is terrible. All the acting is terrible. Like, if you, I'll say this: if you are one to um, smoke or drink um, to, in order to enjoy a movie that you think is going to be bad, do so with this movie because I think it's a dumb fun movie where it's like you just kind of have to let the movie wash over you. Kind of like A Star is Born. It's kind of like A Star is Born 2018 if it was inherently dumber. Like 20, if it had none of the nuance uh, 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 with the country star. Just none. Um, And then let's do some rapid fire thoughts on some video games. So I played a bit of Rise Son of Rome. Yes, that Rise Son of Rome um, on Xbox Series X. Or not Series X. I have the Series S. Um, always going to be confusing. Um, it's still terrible. Um, I don't know. I love Crytek. Um, but that co- the only good thing about that combat is essentially... Um, when you do a finisher, instead of like showing a button prompt above somebody's head, it will like um, the person will glow with the color of, of button you're supposed to press to execute that move, which I found kind of interesting. And there's some Kinect stuff that doesn't work anymore because it was built for Xbox One. Uh, so you just press left, hold down left bumper super awkwardly to order your troops around. Um, that could have been implemented a lot better. Uh, and the combat is just super boring. It's super repetitive. Um, but I think you should have it. Anyone who has Xbox Live Gold should have it. Uh, if you redeemed it all the way back. Um, and gosh, I think that I think that got dropped on. Xbox Live Games with Gold 2017, 2018, something like that. But um, one game I checked out really quickly is Among Us. Um, I've already played quite a bit of it on my uh, Pixel um, that I used to have, uh, and I played a bit on iPhone. Um, It's the same game, although much, 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 much worse because... Now, now that you have a cursor, everything gets like a hundred times harder because 
instead of having like a mouse to move around or just like a, a on-screen analog stick or something like that, you know, easy controls. Um, everything's just the control scheme is just inherently harder for no reason at all. I I, I can't even describe how bad it is. Um, it just it it, it it it's it's like playing. It's like playing a strategy game on a console. It feels wrong, you know? Like, if I was playing Among Us on my laptop, I'd be like, oh, click, 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 type, type, type on my keyboard. Um, but, um, and that would feel right because you have, like, 26 letters and you've got a separate control surface and then you've got all these, you can put it up on a second monitor so you can kind of, like, have Spotify over here, and it's easier that way. Um, and then, like, on a phone, it's just like, oh, I'm just going to do this, do this, and, oh, tap up here, let's on-screen keyboard. It just feels massively better on um, mobile than it does um, on console. I Respect to the people who are playing Among Us on console, but it ain't for me. Um, and then I d dived back into Assassin's Creed Origins um, a little bit. Um, not too much. I maybe played two or three missions uh, here or there. Um, and, you know, it it remains one of... Like, I, I, I know people like Assassin's Creed Origins. Um, but it's the first game where I in the series where I truly felt overwhelmed. Um, in Unity, you're just running around in Paris and a few other locations, I believe. It might, just, it might actually just be Paris. Um, and then, like, Black Flag doesn't feel that big because uh, it was limited by the Xbox One um, hardware. It, there was no Xbox One X or PS5 Pro or PS4 Pro. I don't know anything about a PS5 Pro. I, I promise. I don't know anything about a PS5 Pro. Um, but it, it just... Like, there's so much to do um, in Assassin's Creed Origins that it feels paralyzing. Um, it just... There, everywhere you look, there's markers. And you're like, I've got to do that. 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 Oh, here's another thing I've got to do. Um... And it's just, it, it is simply overwhelming. Um, I, I, I haven't played, I, I've played a bit of Odyssey and a bit of, gosh, what else have I played? I haven't played Valhalla. That's the other one I haven't played. That, that's the only one I haven't played. I've played Syndicate a little bit. I've played basically everything, except for the uh, a few of the Assassin's Creed Chronicles uh, games. Um, but... This was the one where I'm like, ugh, this is, this is open world bloat. Um, but what doesn't have open world bloat though is Madden NFL 22, and we'll talk about Madden NFL 23, I promise. Um, so I I only play face of the franchise because I know I will absolutely get wiped off the face of the earth if I play Madden online. Um, and at this point, um. I don't think my internet was entirely stable yet when I started Face of the Franchise um, a few months back. Um, so Face of the Franchise is an interesting concept. You know, you you get drafted, and then you play a few games, see what team you're going to get uh, drafted to, play a few practice games with them, you know, do some trainings. Um and then you start actually trying to get to the Super Bowl. But like the in-between stuff really needs some work. Um, it didn't really feel like a quote-unquote story mode as uh, one would refer to something that like this where you're actually making progress and have a storyline. Um, it just felt like I was, you know, doing random things. It, it didn't feel like I was making progress with my character. Like... I named my character a specific thing, but because of the limitations, every time I 
I was on field, I came up as John Madden. Um, and I'm like, but that's not who I named that guy as. I, I forget who I named him as. Um, but, like, he had a really distinct personality um, that I created for him. Uh, and it's, like, in the cutscenes, you can't see it. it. It's just, like, he looks half asleep. He looks like he's just trying. He looks like this for video, video uh, viewers, just like, like this all the time. He just looks like this. Um, and and he just mumbled lines, and it was, it was weird. It was very, very weird. Um, and it, but I will say, I liked that it wasn't like eight, three hours, and then you're done. It was like, no, you're gonna play an entire season of of the franchise, and then go from there. And and then it gives you the option: you can keep going, but like it, but. It doesn't matter after after that point. It's like you'll get an expedited experience. Is that I think what it said. Um, so yeah, let's talk about Madden NFL 23. Somehow Madden NFL 23 is even worse because uh, now I've only played one game. Actually, no, two, two or three games, two or three games, um, and it's just when when people wanted. A change in Madden, that's not what they wanted. Field sense is not what they wanted. Oh my goodness. I tried the the new ways of throwing. It's got like a w way where you can control where you throw, uh, a way where you can knock people out of the sky. And generally, that's pretty, you know, that would be something pretty desirable, right? Well, um, the, the problem is it is it makes it much harder to actually make those throws and, and, and in a case where it's not fun um, I, the reason I, I I played Madden NFL 22 as long as I did other than the fact that it was on game pass through the EA play which is a very long and convoluted sentence um, it, it was because, Oh hey, it has a story mode, and I, I was having fun. You know, it, yes, you were going through the motions with Face of the Franchise, but there was stuff I really, really liked about it. You know, there's just like, oh hey, yes, th there's the play art on the field, and it looks really accurate and really nice. And then, oh, I don't have to throw it to the guy with the red line. I can throw it to anyone, and maybe if I. Um, use this guy, I can cut around. It, it, it was very strategic. But now in Madden 23, it all feels just crushing. Um, now, I, I haven't gone back to it since I finished Madden, 20, uh, Madden 22 um, and played that first couple games where it got me into the menus. Um, but, like, it starts you off playing a a Madden tribute game, and it's just like it, it. It it just isn't fun anymore, and that sucks because it's like. And now I could go play like two or three other games of Madden Twenty Three, and it might be fine. I might just need to uh, tweak some settings to maybe instead of going uh, ha have my setting under Pro where it's simulation, uh, maybe I just go back to arcade where, like I was on Madden 22, because that was at least fun, because it's like, oh, hey, I'm sacking people uh, every, few, every uh, uh, at least twice a game, and then I'd make force a fumble, and like there was these really exciting moments where I could be in control of everything that happened, and field sense was kind of, the thing where I was like, oh, maybe this will give me that much more control where instead of, you know, um, getting uh, fouls all the time because um, I tripped on something or, you know, or, or, for, uh, or uh, you know, just all these things, minute things that um, I think are key to the strategy of winning a game in Madden. It just doesn't feel like it's there anymore. It just feels like 
oh, hey, if you, you play this game on simulation, you're just going to be punished. That's, that's what's up. And thankfully, this is only a trial. It only lasts for 10 hours. Um, so we'll see what happens with it. I'll, I'll, I'll keep you guys updated on that. But right now, it's not looking so good. Um, another game I, I played was the uh, Master Chief Collection uh, uh, version of Halo Reach. Um, I, I play, I think I played three or four missions. I, I, I'm at least halfway, or quarter or halfway into the game. And man, Halo Reach on the Series S is fantastic. It is just bonkers how good that thing is. Because it's just like, oh, this is how I remember Halo Reach, which has been the strength of Halo Master Chief Collection for the longest time. You'd play Halo 2 Anniversary, and you're like, oh, man, this is how I remember Halo 2 feeling. Or Halo 3, uh, less so, but, you know, you know, it had improvements, you know. And Halo Reach just feels like, oh, yeah, this is the game I remember playing on Halo, uh, or on uh, Xbox 360. Uh, but it's not because it's in 1080. Uh, I think, I think it's 1080p, 60 frames per second on Series S, and then 4K 60 on on um, Series X. Um, and it just runs like butter. Like loading times are great, um, especially since since it's 117 gigs. I, yeah, you just have to stuff that thing on the SSD, the paltry 512 gigabyte SSD that's in the um, in the Series S, but man, it loads. It loads fast. Um, three seconds as opposed to the thirty seconds or so that it took on the Xbox 360, which is also all, always nice. I might get back. In, I might. I might actually look back into that tonight, or maybe I'll install Skate Free. I don't know. Um, but yeah. Um, I've also been playing a bit of the open beta of multiverses. Um, I, so when I launched this, I didn't know this game was still an open beta. I thought with everything I'd seen on YouTube, I thought the game was out, out. Uh, because I have a uh, noted thing about open betas. Like I, Overwatch 2, I'm not going to play Overwatch 2 until that thing's finished. When, when that thing hits 1.0, that's when I'll play Overwatch 2. Um, because there's this, and, and Multiverses kind of confirms my suspicion about open betas, um, is, and don't get me wrong, I have iOS 16 on here, um, maybe don't show you that because I've got text messages up on that, um, but, um, with pictures, um, and, and uh, of, of friends, um, that I'm sure don't want to be on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, I um, it, there's just some jank here. Like, it's obviously Warner Brothers' answers to Smash Bros. You've got LeBron James. LeBron James. Um, why did I want to say Itchy and Scratchy? Tom and Jerry, Batman, Superman, Arya Stark. Um, and, oh, Batman, Superman, Arya Stark. Uh, Rain Dog. Um, Rick and, no, just Morty right now. Um, that's one of the season one editions. Um, and a few other characters I, I can't remember. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman's the character you start off as. Uh, Shaggy is an, uh, one of the other free characters. Uh, people from Steven Universe, um, which I feel like two of them is a waste of space. Like, maybe just pick one. Maybe, maybe just Steven Universe himself. Um, but anyhow, well, there's also some people from Adventure Time, I think. Anyhow, um, it, but the reason it could confirm my suspicions is there is some jank with multiverses. Now, I don't have the fastest internet connection, I'll, I'll admit. Um, my internet connection is 30 me megabytes per second on a good day. That's nowhere near, like... I, I probably shouldn't even be playing a fighting game with that. But even then, like, my ping's pretty good. At least 
that's what my Xbox says. But like, there will be times where I'm jumping through the air and trying to uh, do a do a up, um, not a up dash, not a right dash, but like, I guess it'd be a right Y. Like, there's a special attack that you can do with a Y, and that's a a great way to do a ring out in this game. Um, and it just doesn't work a lot of the time. Like, I'll be jumping, and then I'll do the up Y or right Y. or Y is my favorite button in the multi multiverses. Um, that and RB, um, right bumper. Um, but there will just be times where I'm, like, going through the air and, like, oh, I got him, I got him, I got him, and, and then I'll appear on the left side of the map even though I was in the middle of the stage when I initiated the... Uh, strike up it, it, it's weird uh it, it or and it's just like little things like that where it's like I, it where it'll trace the line where um where you came from and it's like wait i didn't make that adjustment there um so i i don't know i i might wait a little bit for multiverses to get uh, uh, get to 1.0 um so that those issues can be fixed because yikes um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll update you when it hits 1.0. Uh, I'll skip House Flipper because I barely played this. It's just a nice, relaxing game. Uh, there's nothing much to say about it other than that. Um, if you've played Power Wash Simulator or any of the other simulator games, you know the vibe. Um, it's, it was on Game Pass, so I was like, why not? Um, and then I, I also played Battlefront 2, uh, the twenty. When did this come out? 2017, I think. With Janina, uh, I don't, I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but I'm Versio. Um, I played the campaign for this, um, and I think I'm ninety percent done with this. I actually just have to reinstall it. My hard drive went bad, which I'll talk about after uh, um, I get done with all these games. But, um, but. It's, uh, it, it is a surprisingly good interest, entry in the EA Star Wars video game catalog. Now, Jedi Fallen Order, which uh, it, is good, um, th that's good. Battlefront is now good, um, and I think Battlefront 2 is probably in a place where it's good. I haven't, I haven't actually dove into multiplayer because I have similar fears about um, netcode and whatever that happened with uh, multiverses um, maybe like some lag um, might happen with both battlefront 2 and battlefront 2 is a game where you can have cannot have any lag especially with a droidica um, rolling up on you anyhow uh, I just really like the story of it um, I, I think it it's exactly what people want from a EA Star Wars games like hey you already make battlefield Let's just make Battlefield, but Star Wars. And I get that was already kind of the concept with Battlefront. Um, but, like, this is taken to the nth degree where you're flying TIE fighters and, like, shooting people down. Now, the AI is a little dumb. Um, like, I'll, I'll, I'd be standing in front of people and it'd just be, they'd just be like, oh, I don't know where you are. Um, and there's cheesy actions at pieces, but... Overall, I think you should check out Battlefront 2. It's on Game Pass. It's on EA Play. Go check it out. And it's probably like $3 on a Steam sale or something like that, or Origin sale. Or actually, I think it's called EA... I, I, I think it's just called EA Desktop now. Um, somebody fact-checked me on that. Uh, I'll skip Guardians of the Galaxy because I really didn't play all that much of it. And I'll, I'll just say this. I... I had my first flight in Microsoft uh, Flight Simulator, and here are my thoughts. Um, do not play this on a... Um, don't play this via cloud gaming uh, on a anything lower than like 100 megabytes per second or something, because, oof, you, I would just turn the camera like 90 degrees. Yeah, 90 degrees. Um, 
and I would it, you just see the image degrade to where you could barely make things out. It was awful. <laughs> um, so I, I, when um, when we aren't when I'm done playing through all the Halo games again, uh, I'll I'll be uh, I'll be uh, installing Microsoft Flight Simulator because I I, I want to see what the difference is. Because I, I do like certain aspects of it. You know, there's uh, assists for people like me who don't know how to fly a plane. Um, where it's like, hey, we realize you don't know what you're doing, so we're gonna put a we're gonna automatically and enable assist to where you're not gonna just immediately crash every time you take off. Um, it, it it'll just go on autopilot anytime you, it feels like you're about to crash, which is nice. Now, will I disable that from time to time? Maybe. Um, but for now, no. Um, but I will update you on, on that when I have my second flight. I just didn't want to go through my first flight um, because my I, I, I should say I didn't finish my first flight because I charted a path from uh, Kansas City to, I believe, either Branson or Springfield, Missouri. Both, both Missouri. Uh, KCI in, in Branson Airport, um, and it was in its real time, so it said it was going to take me four hours to get there. I I believe was the flight time, but I I I think Microsoft Flight Simulator could be, um, if um, people o don't already believe this, um, one of the best flight simulators of all time, um, because it just immerses you in every single detail um you'll you'll pass by a flight tower and you'll hear somebody come on the radio and say hey um maintain altitude ten thousand feet or something like that um or twenty thousand i don't i don't know numbers um or make like a right turn or squawk 920s or whatever. I don't know if those are actual flight terms, but they'd, you know, tell you to change frequencies and, and your uh, pilot would respond back and then um, and it, it gave you guidance, like, here's a waypoint for where you need to go um, instead of just saying, well, you'll, fi you'll figure it out. Um, I mean, he knows where he's going, right? He, um, but, like, I, I have played a little bit of the previous flight simulator um, before this, uh, and I feel like that game was just like made for as a simulator simulator, um, where it wasn't accessible to people like me, where I'd want to just have a quick flight, and it was like no, but here I can just say, hey, I want to do the Top Gun Maverick uh, missions. Let me do that, please, and it'll be like, okay, yeah, just do these missions. Uh, which is really, really cool because um, I, I think games, some simulator games that are that have a hardcore audience like this, I feel like sometimes they try to be a, uh, a little, I don't know, they just try to be a little bit catering to that crowd because they know it, those people will buy it and they'll buy like the flight sticks and everything. Um, and uh, so... I appreciate Microsoft's effort to include people like me. So let's get to uh, the hard drive issue. Okay. So my I so since um, my the hard drive the SSD in the Xbox Series S is only 512 gigabytes. I had a external hard drive. That, I, that at the time I was using for business files, I'd offload, uh, you know, my uh, feature images, Instagram, uh, Facebook, all my images, and put it on there. Um, just for safekeeping in case Canva ever shut down or something like that. Um, and uh, easy, act, e easy to access. I just plug it into my laptop and, you know, do that. But once we got the Xbox, I was like, okay, this is a, this external hard drive is going to be a cheap option to uh, extend this because it was a two terabyte drive. It, it still is. Um, 
but the Xbox basically ate the drive. Sorry for hitting the table. It 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 ate the drive in a way I I couldn't even fathom. I so whoever engineered the Xbox Series S, uh, I'm not gonna put you on blast, other than to say why why so here here's the thing uh it, it, it's the stupidest engineering decision i've ever seen so i i i i, I bought i bought an, a, another external drive um a few months after uh, uh, about a c couple months ago i bought uh an external hard drive, two terabytes, uh, a flash drive. Uh, I think uh, I think I also bought something else. I, 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 that might just be it. Um, but I bought a Seagate two terabyte drive, or no, yeah, no, a Seagate two terabyte drive to replace that Western Digital two terabyte drive that is now attached to the Xbox. Series S, so I could keep files on there on the Seagate, uh, and then the I had the um, SanDisk a one flash drive uh, for emergencies only in case you know just just the essential essential um, stuff. So I turn on my Xbox one day, all the games from that hard drive are gone, just gone. It the I plug it into all the USB ports, gone. It none of the ports will recognize the drive. So what I do is I'm like, well, I've got the old Xbox VCR Xbox One uh, sitting in storage. So I'll grab that and hook it into that USB um, thing. It took it a little while, um, but it it it, um, it recognized it. Uh, it, it said it was full, but it recognized it. Um, and I was like, okay, that's a little strange. Plugged it back into the Series S. Still didn't recognize it after like 30 minutes. Then I decided, I wonder what the issue is. So I plugged uh, one of my um, four gigabyte flash drives, you know, something I couldn't even store um, games on. Um, plugged one of those in just to see what the problem was, see if it maybe the USB uh, port had gone bad, any of them, checked all of them, they were all fine. Plas passed with flying colors, I even tr tested the Seagate drive, it, it, it showed up. Uh, I was like, okay. Or I didn't test the Seagate drive, I, tr I tested another flash drive, the five, I have a 512 gigabyte uh, drive that I bought that actually could store games if I wanted to. Uh, Tested in all, all the USB ports. Um, get out of here, fly. Um, and it worked. But when I pulled that flash drive, and I'd, le I'd left it running, the flash drive running, for about 15 minutes at this point. I touched the metal, and it was hot. So I came to two different conclusions. There are two different conclusions of this. A, or two possible causes uh, as to why it wasn't recognizing the drive. Um, A, it was either heating up so much um, that it, it just burned out the drive because it was making, it, it, I will say, it was making a clicking sound uh, when I turned it on. Um, that day when I when the games were gone, um, um, and you know it, it was just it it was hot, so I was like, okay, it could have overheated. Uh, but another thing is, I have turn um, in, in the Xbox settings for uh, I have turn off storage went off. Uh, and I make sure to turn off my Xbox every time. Um, so it just, I guess what it did is overheated. And so 
whoever thought of this bought, somehow bypassed the software that says turn off this hard drive when it's when it's this um, the console's off and just keep running power through that hard drive 24/7 so whoever thought of that I don't like you um, because basically if I want to store m more than gosh 10 games uh, on there uh, and that's a mix of Series S, Xbox 360, and Xbox One games. Um, if I want to store them in more than 10 games on there, um, let's see, what, what, what do I have on there right now? Uh, let's see. Okay, so here's what I've got installed. I've got Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, the new one. Um, it's got 313 megabytes, Control Ultimate Edition, the, uh, which, uh, which is a Series S and X game, um, 44 gigabytes, Halo the Master Chief Collection, 114 gigabytes, uh, Madden NFL 23 Series S ed Edition, uh, 46 gigabytes, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, 43 gigabytes. Multiverses, 6 gigabytes. Tony Hawk's Ghost Recon, a Future Soldier, 9 gigabytes. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, uh, that's 22 gigabytes. Uh, Tunic, and, and Tunic, 3 gigabytes. Uh, and that's how much? How much? I have 55 gigabytes free of 364 gigabytes because it's not three, 512 straight up. And sorry for all the noise uh, happening outside, if you can hear that. Um, but anyhow, um, it's just forcing me into a situation where if I want to store more than those games, I either have to delete one of them, which I'll delete Madden 23 when the 10 hours is up, um, or buy the super expensive Seagate expansion card. Um, so... I'm not looking forward to that at all. Um, now, will I still look into data recovery for that Seagate drive? Of course. Um, but, um, but, but it's not going to be on high on my priority. Um, so, and I, I actually did miss one game. I did play a bit of Pro Skater 1 and 2 last night, and still great. Um, I don't know what else I can say other than that. Uh, Pro Skater 1 and 2 have always been great. I finally finished out most of the goals in Warehouse. Um, I got six go uh The only goal I didn't get on um, that one was the Pro score, I believe, which is like 120,000 or something like that. So, um, But I'm going to keep plugging away at that over the next few weeks. Uh, and keep reporting back. Okay, now let's get to TV. Uh, For All My Kind Season 3 has now wrapped. Um, so, what are my thoughts? Um, this is as bad as High School Musical, the musical, the series Season 2. Um, now, like, I get they're trying to go for a different thing here. Um, but all the stuff with Danny... Uh, was not needed, uh, especially since going into season three, I thought that plot line, I won't say what it was, had been resolved. I thought at the end of season two, okay, we've moved on, that's done. We won't have to deal with that next season. Cool. Because that was a very definitive thing that happened. Uh, and then the stuff with Carrot, I thought, okay, well, um, the, the marriage she's in and in, in at the start, you know, okay, she's settled. She's just gonna be great, but like, for some reason, it's not. Uh, and then the Helios stuff was all bungled. I, I feel like there could have been an easier way to do all that, um, but apparently not. 
Uh, I'm going to try and talk over uh, the noises I'm hearing right now. Um, try not to ra raise my voice too much. Um, but, but all I can hear is... Um, but yeah, it, it, it was just a bad season in my, uh, in my uh, perspective. Um, in my opinion. So, I mean, if you... But it's at this point where it's like, okay, we're in the 80s now. Like, we might as well just keep on going. Uh, they're, or, they're filming season four as we speak, uh, as I speak. Um, so, I mean, I'm still going to watch season four, probably season five, and what, however many seasons they end up doing. But um, this is a step in the wrong direction. I just, it feels like, I don't know, it just feels very um it not well written uh i'll just say that because the acting's great uh but the writing is somewhere out there um and then since it's been a few weeks let's talk about high school musicals the musical series season three episode three uh through five um well actually just check out my review just check out my review of that um, because I'm getting a little long in the tooth. Same thing with She-Hulk Attorney at Law. Um, just check out my, um, reviews of those. Um, I, that, that'll be much more insightful than what I can provide you with today because my brain's going to mush. Um, so let's see. What did, have I recently posted? I posted my review of Vengeance. I'll be posting the video review, uh, this week, uh, since it's been... Since I'm I'm trying to get back on track with video reviews, um, I'll find a way to make that into a TikTok, um, because people have uh, enjoyed the short form content I do on Instagram and uh, TikTok. So, and they voted for me to do short form reviews. So I'll start doing those. Um, then I announced the 2022 Mid Year Real Awards nominees, and you can vote on those now. Um, a, a bunch of, a, a very diverse group of nominees. I, I did not think we were going to see after Yang and Bitterbrush and uh, everything everywhere all at once. I thought we were going to see like, I don't know, I thought we were going to see like triple A movies. And there are some in there like Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, but like, I don't know, and Thor Love and Thunder. Um, but I, I, it's kind of refreshing to look at the nominees and see how many indie movies there are in there. It kind of makes me feel good. But you can vote on those using the same link uh, as I have in uh, in the show notes. Uh, it, it, it's just embedded in the little article. Um, then you can check out my uh, commentaries of season three of High School Musical, the musical series, uh, as well as those reviews. Uh, my review of Emily the Criminal uh, is up, as well as my review, commentary, and reviews of She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, episodes one and two. I also have my Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness commentary up. I'll have a digital review out this week. Uh, I have the next on Disney Plus September 2022 schedule up. I have the uh, Tribeca 2023 dates and submissions uh, details also up. I have the first details for the 2023 Spirit Awards up. Um, Halloween Ends is going to uh, be on in theaters and on Peacock on the same day, October 14th. I'll have that art article up talking about my thoughts about that. Uh, I also have uh, details on the digital and physical release dates of Thor Love and Thunder, as well as the goodies contained inside each, including some technical details like the subtitle tracks and the audio tracks for those who want to um, uh, listen to that. I'll have um, a bunch more this week, obviously. Um, so until next time, that, that's been the Austin B Media Podcast. Um, uh, if you want to get early access to the podcast, just go uh, to patreon.com slash Austin B Media, like I said before. Uh, get, ship me $1 and get everything uh, uh, 24 hours uh, at, at the very least uh, in advance as well as the commentaries no extra charge 
So if you if you like that, go to patreon.com slash awesome media or you can just purchase the commentaries themselves. Uh, here this month, I'll have the uh, season three commentaries of High School Musical and Musical Series discounted at 50 cents a track, uh, which means the uh, total uh, for the season, if you buy them, if you add them all to your cart, will be like $4 or something like that. Um, my brain's mush, so sorry about that. But without further ado, see you next time. <laughs>